questions over to our today's presenters. Excellent. Thanks, Patrick. I really appreciate it. This is Patrick Revord from HUD, not to be confused. Uh, I am in uh, the Office of Community Plan Planning and Development in the sub-office of Economic Resilience. And we ran the Sustainable Communities Initiative grant program um, for the past few years and uh, now have some things to share on what we learned from our grantees, our planning grantees, on uh, data, the data and metrics that they used for their planning. So, of course, to begin, uh, the friendly disclaimer here, this presentation is a topical webinar, so we're providing advice and information about general resilience planning activities, but it is not an official word on anything from the NDRC uh, or the NOFA. Uh, so if you have any questions on that, obviously check out the HUD Exchange or email specific questions to resilientrecovery at hud.gov. So a brief introduction to those of us on the call today. Again, as I said, my name is Patrick Revord. Uh, I have handled the, the gathering the data from our 143 Sustainable Communities grantees, and now we are working on reporting on that data up to uh, a higher level, Congress. <laughs> and um, I will say we have had some great successes among our grantees, but also some issues. And so as they say hindsight is 2020, right now we are looking back and hopefully I can offer you some of, some of that 2020 hindsight about what our planning grants could and should have done back when they sat in your seat uh, ready to begin their plans. And I will let Adrian and Holly introduce themselves. Uh, my name is Holly St. Clair and I'm Director of Data Services from the Metropolitan Area Planning Council in Boston. My name is Adrian Evans Burke. I'm an analyst at the Department of Housing and Urban Development in DC, specifically the Office of Strategic Planning and Management. So uh, we'll try, the three of us will try to walk through the best info we have here. But uh, the, for those on the call, please uh, feel free to share your experiences and ideas with others on the line. So. During the presentation, you can submit any comments or, or questions you have on that side question box, and then we'll try and address them as they come in. So with that, we'll begin by asking the question, why measure? Uh, as, as planners and project managers and leaders of communities, we often have an idea of how our city is and an idea of how we want it to be. But those are just ideas. There are some problems with the situation. What if our current perception is incorrect? And what exactly does our ideal community look like? Uh, we have to have some context to get from here where our, where our community currently is to where we want to go. And so metrics provides that map, data and measurements. So first we kind of have to determine where we are. We define metrics and indicators. Uh, we measure baseline numbers that describe where our community is on the map and where we currently are. Then we determine where we're going. We talk about what the measures will look like in, at a future time and where we want to be. Finally, as we choose our course forward, we choose an action to undertake, we continue to measure to see if we're taking the most direct route there. Now, as NDRC applicants, you guys are already on that journey. Uh, hopefully through phase one, you've developed a vision for what you want your ideal resilient city to look like. And hopefully you've begun uh, articulating the goals of how you want to get there. But now in phase two, it's time to choose the, the route, the course to take from where you currently are to where you want to be. And so uh, trying to, it's, it's time to build your data management process to to figure out where you are and, and how the best to get there. So it can be intimidating, I know. Uh, it's, it's a big task, but um, today we'll hopefully walk through the reality of, of how to do it and some achievable steps. So a quick look at where we're going. We'll start off um, with some terminology to get, all get on the same page. Then we'll talk about setting goals, start big, uh, then turning those goals into actual metrics and indicators. 
to measure along the way. And then we'll talk about how to set up a data team and a management system to actually handle the information that's coming through your office. And then finally, we'll get to data analysis and communicating that analysis to the public. So quickly, to dive back into why measure, um, the fundamental principle is obviously where are we and where are we going and how do we get there. But there are a few more reasons. Uh, first of all, we, we live in an age of limited resources. Uh, our staff time is limited. Your constituents' time is limited. Uh, obviously, there's limited money. And so as you're moving forward, you can't be moving blindly. You have to know, is what we're doing really the most effective way to do it? And so metrics allow you to tell if you're being effective and, in fact, how effective your actions are. Uh, obviously, next, um, there's increased accountability. We, uh, we live in an age of scrutiny of government and funding, and so we have to be able to transparently say uh, what the results of, of the funding have been, uh, how we've used the money that the public has given us, and good analysis and good publication can, can help build that trust. Um, obviously, strong analyses and, and good data backing that up can also be useful for outreach. It can make for a good pitch to media outlets. Um, newspapers are often more willing to pick up stories that have uh, good strong numbers behind them. Uh, numbers can be a valuable influencing tool. So when trying to convince other people of your position or, or why or how you spent the money the way you did, it can be important, obviously, to talk about uh, why you made the decisions you did and back those up with numbers. And then uh, also, numbers can help you engage with your constituents, with the public. Uh, people are really willing to participate in, in visual representations of what's going on in their city. It can help educate them so they also become decision makers along with you. And it can help them care about what's going on around them uh, rather than just experiencing it. And as far as the NDRC, um, obviously you're at a really important point right now be before you've begun your interventions. Uh, to, to ask how, what is the current state of our city and then to know whether what you've done is, has been successful. So it's really important to set up um, your metrics and indicators now. So to start off with some terminology just to make sure we're all on the same page, um, I, wanna, I wanna go back to phase one of the NOFA, if you guys remember as you were filling out your applications in the long-term commitment section, the, the NOFA asked specifically for uh, you guys to list a, a metric, a baseline measure, and then a, an outcome measure. And it's a three-part question, and, and unfortunately many of the, uh, the applicants struggled with the task. We received responses like, uh, our community will be resilient by 2022, okay? We plan to remove 26 houses from the floodplain. That's getting there. We've got a number there. Or uh, we currently have zero infrastructure, green infrastructure demonstration projects, and uh, we will fund 12. Okay. So all of these uh, responses don't quite answer the question in an actionable way. Uh, we have to know both where we are and where we're going and by when. So we'll start going through uh, the, the words here. First of all, a metric um, is obviously a measure used to track an activity over time. So what is a measure? Uh, a measure is a number of something. It can be 22 houses. Uh, it could be $3 million in tax revenue, uh, 12 counts of flooding. Uh, but right away, the first example of our community will be resilient doesn't have a measure in it. How, how are we able to measure resilient, yes or no, one or zero. Um, next up, when setting goals, we have to have a baseline. The baseline is a measure at a specific point in the past, and we use it for comparison when going forward. But it's important to both have the measure, the number, and the date. We have to know when that, when that measure was taken. The baseline should not be set arbitrarily. It should be measured before we began taking action so that now when we measure that same metric again, we're able to determine if our action has made a difference. 
So in the second example, we removed 26 houses from the floodplain. There is no baseline in this. Were, were there 30 houses in the floodplain to begin with? Were there 300? Is 26 even a significant number? So, um, and we also have to establish when that occurred. Finally, uh, a projection is a future looking number. Much like a baseline value, it has to have a measure, a number, and a date. So uh, to only say that we will have uh, 12 projects funded uh, is valiant, but does that mean 12 projects, you know, green infrastructure projects funded in the next year or in the next 100 years? Uh, so it's important to both have, again, a number and a date. So uh, to strengthen, to, to use these definitions to, to strengthen the metric, um, we could say instead of, instead of saying the output of 12 green infrastructure projects funded, we could say that really the outcome of having a green infrastructure project is reduced flooding in the neighborhood. So a strong metric would be the count of flooding incidents in a specific neighborhood with a measured baseline of 26 in, tw in the year 2014 and a goal of only 10 incident flooded, 10 flooding incidents by the year 2018, by the time the projects are done. So it's more, it's actually more than a three part question. It's almost uh, a six part question because each part has to have both the measure and the year involved as well. So that's just kind of a word uh, of, of caution for the past and then a word of hope for the future that, that will <laughs> include years and measures for each of those. Uh, a few more words, uh, terms to kind of get through. Obviously, we're talking about data. We're talking about a collection of information. Um, and then generally, a data set would be a group of related data. So like the American Community Survey would be a data set. It has housing data, income data, education level data. Uh, when we talk about data management, we are talking about uh, how basically how the spreadsheet is handled. It could mean creating fields in a spreadsheet. It could mean creating relationships between fields, um, removing bad entries, uh, making sure all phone numbers are in the same 10-digit format. All of these are examples of data management. Uh, data mapping, however, would be defining the relationships between those data sets. Uh, data modeling is, is using a hypothesis to project to the future. So, for example, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has created a model or a hypothesis for how climate change might play out. So a model takes into account uh, a theoretical input, like the amount of carbon released, and then would spit out a uh, theoretical output based on the hypothesis, so like the global temperature in the IPCC model. An indicator, compared to, as compared to a metric, an indicator is the proverbial canary of metrics. Uh, it's the strongest indication that we're heading in the right direction. So all indicators are metrics. Uh, here's an example. If, if our goal is to have a strong mixed-use neighborhood in our downtown, our action might be to change the zoning code. There are a number of metrics that you could measure. You could measure population increase in downtown, uh, the dollars of commercial income, but the best metric available for what we're trying to do might be the number of building permits requested, the number of new building permits. So we could use this one data piece as an indicator and not collect the other ones necessarily and save time while still having a good proxy for the success of our action. So uh, it's important because obviously we have limited time and limited resources to really focus in on what those strongest indicators are for the, for the goal that we want to achieve. And then finally, analysis as opposed to the data management and data collection side, analysis would be uh, beyond just outputting that data into a, into a spreadsheet or a graph, the analysis would require an extra element of critical thinking. So framing the data in the context of the problem or goals or the community and the situation in which it's in. And determining, uh, not, and determining then where, where the, it's pointing you to go towards in the future. So should we change our course? Uh, analysis is being able to make decisions 
complex decisions based on the nuances of the data. Really quick, Holly and Adrian, anything to add on, on this thus far? Uh, no, I think these definitions are good, and um, I think it's important to have definitions because I think we all use these words interchangeably, and I think it is helpful for clarity's sake to be really clear about what you're trying to do. So if you're trying to create an indicator versus a general metric, I think is important. I think we actually encounter the same problem working here in the data shop in HUD with the fact that offices throughout the agency use different words use indicator and metric interchangeably, um, and sometimes use the term goal and metric interchangeably. Uh, so it's really important for you to be on the same page, not only with your organization or your team, but also with the stakeholders that you're working with uh, so that they understand exactly what terminology you're using and everyone has the same expectations uh, uh, in terms of terminology and, um, and, and the language that you're using. That's excellent. So with that, actually, Adrian, I'll let you uh, I'll let you take on goals and, and what makes a goal different than an indicator. Sure, thanks. Uh, well, just real quick, uh, here at HUD in the Office of Strategic Planning and Management, our shop is responsible for pulling together all the offices throughout HUD to put together HUD's strategic plan. This is drafted every four years uh, and contains uh, our targets our metrics, our ways of measuring progress, uh, and our goals. So it's really important to set really good goals uh, because that's how you define, uh, you, you define success against those goals. Um, and as an agency that's constantly going to the hill and trying to justify the work we do and trying to uh, ask for money, uh, it's important that we can point to these goals and say we have a plan and this is how we're following it. It is a bit cliche, but we do live and die by the SMART method here at HUD, uh, particularly in this office. SMART being goals should be specific, measurable, agreed upon, realistic, and time-framed. And all of our well-crafted goal statements include all of this information. I'll give you an example of a goal that we have here at HUD, uh, a bad example, a decent example, and a good example of measuring the same thing. Uh, increase uh, uh, green buildings in our community or make our community greener. And that's getting towards some type of definition of green. Are we talking about renewable energy? Are we talking about water? or energy efficiency communities? Are you talking about public housing, private homes, commercial buildings? Now, you can get a little bit more specificity and say increase the energy efficiency of housing across HUD programs. Now we know we're talking about HUD programs. We're talking about housing and not commercial buildings. We know we're talking about energy efficiency, but we still we don't know what increase means because we don't know how much we're increasing. We don't know what the time period is, five years, two years, six months. Now the actual goal that we have here at HUD, which gets refreshed every two years because we do uh, time-bound goals, we do two-year priority goals, the actual goal statement is between October 1st, 2013 and September 30th, 2015, HUD aims to increase the energy efficiency and health of the nation's housing stock by enabling 160,000 cost-effective, energy-efficient, or healthy housing units. So right there you have everything that's smart. Specific, we're talking about what type of housing, we're talking about energy efficiency and health, um, which frankly we can even get more specific and mention that we're talking about uh, lead hazard mitigation. It's measurable, so we're increasing by 160,000 units. It's agreed upon. This is something that we worked with EPA, DOE, and internally to agree upon what these words mean and what we're aiming for. It's realistic. We didn't say 500,000 units because we don't have the funding or the manpower uh, or the grants to push those big numbers. And it's time-framed. It's two years. Uh, I cannot 
stress enough. I, I, I know many folks are probably nodding their head when we're saying specific, when we're saying realistic, when we're saying time frame, uh, time framed. But I cannot emphasize enough the kind of middle of the SMART equation, which is agreed upon. Oftentimes, uh, you and your stakeholders, you and your partners, may have the same vision, but may disagree on the ways to get there, and may even disagree on terminology. We've done a lot of work with VA, uh, Veterans Affairs, on tackling veterans' homelessness and chronic veterans' homelessness issues. But come just getting down to the definitions of words, what is it to be homeless? Uh, do we count folks who are in temporary housing? Does it need to be permanent housing? Uh, chronic versus just homeless. You think you're maybe getting a little too cute there, but these definitions and terms matter, and you really need to agree among your stakeholders what you're trying to count. Because when you're working with stakeholders and you both think you're counting the same thing, but you're not, your data is useless. So that's an example of kind of a bad to good to great uh, goal that we use in HUD. And again, I highly recommend the SMART method for your organizations. Specific, measurable, agreed upon, realistic, and time frame. Excellent. Thank you, Adrian. So we'll, so we'll take the next step. After defining those SMART goals, uh, we have to decide what numbers we're actually going to measure and keep track of. So uh, this can be a challenging process. There are a lot of potential metrics in the world, uh, a lot of things that can be counted, a lot of data that exists. So it's important to make sure that the metrics are directly related to the goals and that maximizing the metric will maximize the goal because uh, sometimes giving the wrong metric can lead to a perverse outcome if, if, it, if it leads if it leads an actor to do something just to increase their numbers. So, uh, yeah, obviously, first of all, we want to link the indicators directly to the goal. It, it helps people focus, and in fact, people may, or, you know, constituents may also offer better solutions if they know what the ultimate goal is behind it. Maybe we're not measuring the right thing. Maybe we're not going about it the right way to reach that goal behind it. Uh, Next, just collecting data for data's sake isn't helpful. So the, the, the metrics and indicators have to fit into the context of the larger plan. Um, and you have to know what success means for each metric. So for instance, uh, in, if someone says that they want to measure the age of housing stock, the age of a house in a community, the question immediately arises, well, what's better? Older housing stock that's been around longer, newer housing stock? And if they say newer housing stock, then the follow-up question is, well, are we trying to encourage people to build new houses? Is that what our ultimate goal is? So uh, it's important to not only set the metric, but to determine what success looks like. Is it an increase? Is it a decrease? And then why that change will lead to the goal. Uh, next, think big but start small. I, you know, setting up a data system uh, and, and performance metrics can just be incredibly overwhelming. There's, like I said, there's so much out there. Where to even begin? Uh, so actually, this was advice from Holly, and she says to pick 10 indicators and just build from there. So just being able to manage that and feeling comfortable with that can can help one build your team's confidence, but two also be early wins, early successes. So you start talking about where those early indicators are leading and your partners start getting excited about where the project is going and with there you can build more support, roll more people in and, and, and build from there. But, but you've got to start somewhere. So don't bite off more than you can chew at the beginning. Um, output versus outcomes. This is kind of an important consideration to make. Um, outputs can be considered what your organization does or what they create. So it might be making a grant. Uh, it might be making a widget. Whereas the outcomes ask what changes take place in people's lives or in the community because of your organization. 
So I kind of got to it earlier with the, with the green infrastructure grant. So uh, an output metric would be to say, we gave out 12 green infrastructure grants. whoop de doo Why did that change the community? So the outcome, a first level outcome might be to say, and because of the green infrastructure in the neighborhood, there was decreased flooding. So the outcome is decreased flooding in that neighborhood. Now, some, there's, there's a spectrum, uh, both in time and geography, in outputs and outcomes. So in time, uh, the, usually the, the first thing that happens is the actual output. You create the project or product. And then there are, there are first level outcomes, the people who are directly affected by that product or project. And then going down the line, there are longer and often bigger and often harder to measure outcomes, so secondary and tertiary level outcomes. So it's important to kind of consider, is, is what we are measuring important? And, and it's hard because often the, the further down the line, the more important things become, but then as, is what we are measuring possible to measure? And further down the line, things get harder to measure. So, those are just two things to consider uh, when, when considering the, the time scale of indicators. There's also a spatial scale, and uh, especially at the scale of a lot of these NDRC grants working across states, regions, uh, counties, it's important to have nested data sets. So to be able to break up data at a county level uh, at, you know, have statewide aggregated data, and then also to be able to take it down to the community level, neighborhood, or uh, block level data, because that is, that will help inform decision making and will help fine tune it based on the different scales. So it also allows for effective communication back to the, the back to the different constituents. Obviously some are really concerned about the neighborhood they live in, but the statewide data doesn't really matter to them, whereas uh, people acting at the state level obviously don't care what's going on necessarily in that tiny little neighborhood. They want the big needle to move on the whole state. So, uh, Holly, anything to add there about turning goals into indicators? Uh, I, I do think, uh, I agree with everything you said, and I think that um, this is really more of an art than a science, even though we're presenting it in a very scientific way. I think that um, it is important to really think about, and I hate to use this word because um, I feel like a lot of funders, not HUD, but other funders have pushed us to really talk about this a lot, but I feel like your indicators need to be surrounded or your metrics need to be surrounded by some sort of framework or theory of change about why we're gonna measure one thing because we think we have implementation um, steps that will obtain this goal, you really have to start to really articulate that all the way through so you understand what you should be measuring to, to capture the sort of signal that your your implementation can send out. And I think that one of the other challenges here is this point around time scale. Often many of us are creating um, implementation steps that we won't see the impacts of until years down the line. And so I think um, thinking about the time scale in a way that not only informs your indicators, but can help help you think about what different indicators might pick up the signal over time um, as different parts of your change start to sort of roll out from your implementation steps. Um, and then finally, just speaking from experience, um, definitely think big, uh, but start small. Um, we have a great Metro Future project here in, in Boston, and we have a uh, over 256 goals and objectives and many more indicators than that. And um, we are collecting a lot of data and putting it out there, but you know, we're also in the process of pairing back many of the indicators and metrics that we said we'd collect. So I think what's important is not to overcommit, but to make sure you really can deliver what you say you're gonna measure and add over time as it becomes more apparent which ones you should be following and, and really emphasizing. And um, I think that can be hard when you're managing multiple constituents from different uh, interest areas. Absolutely. Well, we'll move on to uh, creating the data management system and team to actually handle these goals and indicators now that we've created. So I think uh, 
step one is, is really prioritizing data work early on in the grant and planning process. And this has to be done both with, you know, a, a verbal commitment from upper level management and leadership, but also a financial commitment uh, to be able to set aside people's time, uh, their work hours, and also funding to be able to pull data sets together and to be able to pay for analyses and to be able to communicate those analyses. Um, and I just can't stress that enough, it, and that, that now is the time to do it. Uh, looking back at the SCI grantees, uh, there were those like Holly and, and, and Metropolitan Area Planning Council who early on had an idea of the data they wanted to collect and, and prioritized it throughout their grant application and all of their grant applications and in the partnerships that they made. And then there were other grantees who it, was, who it came as an afterthought. And trying to tag it on as an afterthought just hardly works uh, because your whole process of, of where you're going is informed by the measurements that you're taking along the way. So with that, uh, like I said, ongoing work, uh, it has to be planned as a system. We just talked about the time scales that data measurement occurs at. And most of those time skills are the long run. You know, we can, we can usually track our outputs in the short term uh, within a year or two, like, like the Adrian's HUD example of the number of homes that we've actually retrofitted for green uh, for energy efficiency. That's, that can be tracked in the short run. But the question about what, what happened to those residents, were they able to save money in the long run because of the retrofits? Um, were they able to save energy actually because of those retrofits? These are the types of things that need to be tracked over long time scales, 5, 10, 20. Population change might be tracked at a 50-year time scale. Uh, so it's important to plan that into your management system. Do you have a personnel who's dedicated or a, a position that will be dedicated to handling these incoming numbers and, and managing them for the, for the next scale that big? And of course, it's hard sometimes to think that far ahead. Uh, so I guess do the, you do the best you can at, at the time you have. But uh, same consideration with computer systems. Are, is the format that we're using going to be viable in the long term, or will it be able to be converted to something that's viable in the long term? Uh, it's important to consider both uh, how widely used a data, set, a data format is, um, you know, maybe what does your state GIS department do? If they do, you know, ArcGIS, SDC, you might want to consider doing that. But ArcGIS is also expensive. So another consideration is, and this is kind of a, a modern idea, is the open data format. What are the open source options? Do they fulfill your needs? And if so, uh, will they fulfill the long-term needs as well? And being able to take that into consideration can help decrease your costs while increasing the long-term viability of the project. So uh, also, next up, establishing uh, data intake and management protocols. Uh, obviously, you have to have a plan for how you're going to gather the data, how it's going to be collected. Uh, that's coming into your organization. Then once in your organization, how you're going to store it, who's going to be in charge of it, who's going to manage it, uh, what format it will be in. And then also standards for uh, how it's going to be saved, how it's going to be distributed. Maybe that means publishing an Excel document once a year. Maybe it means updating your uh, community's GitHub website and publishing that out uh, or posting that for public consumption. So it's important to establish the protocol along the whole way and to not only have a baseline protocol to say, look, at a minimum, here's what we need to do to make sure that we have functional, usable data, but also to establish kind of a gold standard to say, you know, if people have time, we should try to work to this standard of data and, and organization because it will help us uh, draw stronger analyses at the end. Uh, um, if I may, this is, a, this is Adrian Evansburg again with HUD. Uh, this is a key I think you need to really drive home or everyone needs to think about is uh, the expectations in terms of data collection and management protocols. Um, we have a great team here at HUD uh, it, 
working on performance management and data-driven management. But it was put in place to work with data sets that had been in place for years and years before this uh, part of the organization was created. Therefore, it's been a very long struggle working with all the program offices that use very disparate data collection systems and formats and programs uh, to wrestle with all this data. And we spend a lot more man hours than we would like taking all these different formats and reporting methods and twisting them and putting all these round pegs in our square holes so we can actually get usable information and crunch it and analyze it. And you will save yourself so much time on the back end if, if on the front end the folks that you're working with to get your data and you're collecting data, if they already know the format and the delivery method and all the protocols to bring that data in, because the more massaging you have to do to make it usable, the more man hours and money you're spending on playing with data instead of working uh, on a, making your program more successful. So that's just my two cents. It's been a, a long-term pain point here at HUD having so many different protocols and standards out there. Now I can speak on the other half of that. As one of the programs that reports to Adrian's office, uh, we even struggle with our partners, you know, the other community grant planning programs, um, trying to figure out what, what are we reporting? Are we reporting partners? Are they reporting the same type of partners? Are we all sending it in Excel access? I mean, there's, I, it, was a, it was a great, great message, Adrian, as to there, it's an entire process about how to, you know, even the minutia of how to, who to send it to, where the spreadsheets are saved, that all needs to be considered uh, to have a strong framework for the data management. So taking it to the next step beyond that, we'll look at data gathering, and there are kind of three I've, I've broken it out into three, a spectrum of three ways of gathering data. First, there's the existing data sets, uh, the national level, the local level data sets. Then there are some of the more inaccessible data sets, maybe private data or data that you need to, you know, manually gather yourselves. Or, I mean, I'm sorry, and then the third level would be manually gathering data yourselves. So, at the, at the, first level, the easy level, there are the big public data sets most of you are familiar with, I'm sure, um, the American Community Survey, the American Housing Survey, data.gov. Then there are some local data sets that some of our uh, sustainable communities grantees used uh, to, to kind of use as indicators in their projects, and I thought some of them were kind of interesting. A lot of them asked, what are our partners already collecting? And so sometimes, our, a lot of our grantees were the Metropolitan Planning Organization, and so they would kind of take the role of gathering the already existing data sets in their community, uh, maybe the new building permits, the road work data, the city tax revenue, crime data, uh, local school data. They, they brought all of these organizations' data together under one roof and under one database and were able to gain so much more information out of that. Uh, another thing to consider is the 311 data. This is really cool because, one, it's matched with geographic coordinates. It is citizen submitted. You have people right out on the streets complaining about things that they see every day. And, um, and by acting on those things, it will allow you to demonstrate changes in your citizens' lives. So if they experience an issue out, you know, a day-to-day -day thing that they've been reporting, and you can say, look, we decreased the number of times that that issue occurred, then that's a very real way to show people that you're, that you're influencing their life every day rather than just creating a widget or, or outputting a certain number of projects. Uh, another thing with this is you can use existing data sets as a proxy for other data that you might not be able to get. Uh, so, for instance, uh, it's hard, it may be hard to measure neighborhood decline, but you could measure uh, new home starts, or you could measure home sales prices and use those as a proxy for neighborhood decline. Finally, um, as far as existing data structures, uh, I would encourage you to check out the National Neighborhood Indicators Project. I should have written it out on this slide, but it's the National Neighborhood Indicators Project through the Urban Institute. 
and they have about 30 cities around the U.S. who are really pioneering strong sets of indicators and are really are doing their the heavy work to try and gather these multiple data sets under one roof. So I encourage you to check out that list and see if there is a one of these neighborhoods near you, and. Uh, obviously try and tap into what they're doing, if not be able to assist them a little bit with the data that your organization might have. Pat, can I just add a word in? This is Holly. Um, it's actually the National Neighborhood Indicators Partnership. Pardon me, yeah. And, um, and the reason we started to talk about this was because I think one of the things that's important for some of the folks on the webinar to remember is that you don't have to do it all and you don't have to be an expert. There are usually some sort of data clearinghouse near you, whether it's part of a university or uh, it's an NNIP partner, it's important to maybe meet with them early on so that you know, you're not reinventing the wheel, that you're strengthening the wheel in your community and divvying up data sets that you both are interested in but maybe have different expertise in, have different funding sources to work together with. Um, again, really thinking about data as an infrastructure that your community does need to build and that you should build collaboratively together from many different resources and thinking about how this project fits into that and how much your project would have benefited if people before you had already done this. Um, but in particular, the National Neighborhood Indicators Partnership are 30 different types of organizations or 30 different organizations that are different types from universities to regional planning agencies to nonprofits who specialize in using data to measure change in neighborhoods um, and using indicators in their work. Now, you might not have one in your particular city or region, but you might have one in your state. And most of us, when we download data, we usually are already downloading or working with data even on a statewide level. So they might have um, the ability to get, sort of give you a leg up to get started on some of that work. Um, so I think it's just important to remember you're not alone, there are resources. Thank you for that clarification, too, on partnership. Uh, I'm sorry, one last thing on that NNIP. They're also, um, they have a good library on their website of like MOU, data MOU, some um, you know, data sharing agreements, which you'll probably need to look at. Also, um, different, I think we started a job description database. There's a whole bunch of like, if you need to start a data um, portion of your group, like there's some nuts and bolts, really practical uh, resources on their website as well. Wonderful. Uh, so the next type of gathering data would be those inaccessible data sets. As Holly alluded to, um, almost every community has anchor institutions, the hospitals, the universities that are there and have been there a long time. Uh, generally, they not only have a long-term stake in, in how the city turns out, but they report to a board, and so they often gather data about what about their institution and what's going around going on around them. So those are great partners to work with in your project. Um, Holly also recommended to me the, a, a call for data sets. So so make a list of those indicators that you do want but don't have, and and make it an advocate an advocacy initiative. Uh, you might create a top 10 most wanted data sets and, and publish that around and, and then try and solicit different ways to get them, uh, either through community or partner participation, or um, sometimes you'll have to pay for them yourself um, or engage a philanthropy to pay for them for you. Uh, so at times it can be strategic to pay for data. Um, as Holly said, it's a piece of infrastructure. And uh, we're reaching the point where there are many private data sets that can be quite informative, and sometimes it's worth the, your organization's time and money to just set money aside and pay for it because staff time isn't free either, and, and often it's already prepackaged and prepared. Um, so in, in some senses, actually, local philanthropies can be both an anchor institution uh, and might gather data themselves, or it can also be a funder as well and, and can give good funding for some of those private data sources. So engaging philanthropy can, can be a critical long-term win in your region. Finally, we'll just talk about recording your own data. Um, there are obviously a bunch of different options here. You, you know, some communities put out their own sensors. Uh, that would be like a bike trail sensor to count users, GPS from a bus uh, to determine congestion, or a, uh, a rain level gauge. These would all be first-hand data that, you, that you're collecting. 
Uh, you can do surveys, not only a survey of your constituents, but uh, like a dashboard housing survey where you drive around and do a visual analysis or inspection of housing. Uh, there are interesting software tools now that can be used for gathering first-hand data. Uh, I know some of our partners in the Sustainable Communities Grants were Place Matters, who had a, and actually, Holly, you participated with Place Matters too, so hopefully you can expand on this, but there's, for instance, uh, a sidewalk condition mapping tool where, where it's, it becomes citizen science where people go around and record the condition of the sidewalks in front of their home and then it, it maps it all out into a great kind of red, orange, green map of, of the parts of town that have either very good or very poor sidewalk conditions. Uh, so that kind of ties into the citizen science there. Holly, anything to add about, about software or citizen science or gathering? Uh, I think the other sort of newer area um, is the idea of sort of scraping from websites, which mm. there's legalities you have to pay attention to for that, but I think um, we shouldn't ignore that in terms of if you're just trying to get data for planning and not repurpose, repurposing their data and just publishing it back out. For example, we're um, starting to work with Airbnb data to understand how the sharing economy is affecting our vacant housing stock um, and possible new resources for um, funding of affordable housing through uh, lodging taxes to be applied to Airbnb. So I, I think we should just also be aware that there's new data sources that are starting to pop up all over the place that we need to think about that people provide, for example, Craigslist and looking at rent data and so on. Wonderful. So we've, we've moved through the gathering of the data, but we've moved through setting the goals, determining our indicators, setting up our data team. Now we've gathered data, we have it, and now it is time to analyze and communicate that data. So, uh, this is an all important step because even if you make it through those first goals or the first uh, steps of the process along the way, but just hang on to the data yourself, it is of little value. And so it's important to be able to have a strong analysis um, to communicate what the data actually means. Where is it pointing us? Uh, you know, maybe what, what, how, what, are, what is the current state of our community? Maybe it's not what people believe. Uh, is our activity really moving the dial on, on changing that current state? Uh, so with strong analysis, uh, it, as, as we mentioned earlier in, in the benefits of gathering and, and recording data, it can be picked up by the press and can be used to actually change people's opinions on things. Uh, it can, decision makers or um, stakeholders are more likely to support an action that comes from good data and thoughtful analysis. Uh, funders are willing to pay for a project that has been demonstrated to work. Citizens will stand behind a project that's successful. I, it, it goes across the whole spectrum. Uh, there's obviously a fine line about communicating data and metrics, um, and that is that you wanna give enough information to be clear and accurate, but you obviously don't wanna overwhelm. So, um, that's just something to consider along the way of analysis and communication. I know, I know we're getting towards the end here. Uh, Adrian or, or Holly, anything to add about analysis and communication before we wrap it up? Nope. No, so, good. so again, we, I mean, we've, so hopefully we've laid out all the steps today and uh, you guys can all feel comfortable about, about moving forward in the process. I want to again vocalize the importance of uh, gathering commitment among all your stakeholders and partners and, and leadership and setting aside specific time and, and funding to make sure that data management and analysis occur. Um, you, as applicants, you've probably determined your project goals and now is the perfect time to determine uh, what your indicators will be. So please do not miss this opportunity. And I assure you it will bear great fruit down the road when you're trying to consider the successes of your project uh, five and, and 10 years from now. So with that, we will turn to questions. Uh, hopefully Patrick and TJ can open up the phone lines for us and it looks like we have a few written questions uh, as well. So I'll start with those. Uh, we have one from Dave Haddis who says, resilience addresses shocks and stresses. Is that right? Can you give some specific examples of metrics and indicators of shocks and stresses? 
Sure. Um, so uh, when speaking of shocks and stresses, uh, these do kind of fall into a couple of different buckets. You can think of uh, physical shocks and stresses, as in uh, buildings, infrastructure, uh, recovery times on rebuilding infrastructure and buildings. Uh, then there's also kind of the secondary effects of uh, when an area is affected by uh, any type of disruption, and there's usually uh, ec economic viability or economic health. So anything around jobs, income, taxes. Um, and then there's also the social well-being. Uh, so uh, are folks, uh, I'm just kind of going off the top of my head here, but you know, are are, do folks feel safe? Crime indicators, uh, school attendance, uh, and this is again, this goes back to being very creative uh, and being mindful of the kind of data that you have access to. Sometimes the types of data that you have access to will inform what indicators you can track um, rather than kind of putting an indicator out there and then finding due to privacy issues or just due to access or expense issues, you can't get that kind of data. Um, I usually kind of look at what's available and then think from there. So again, kind of thinking in terms of infrastructure, uh, economics, and also social well-being, I think those are kind of three places to start when you're thinking of uh, shocks and stresses that affect the community. Thanks, Adrian. All right, it sounds like we got something from Frank. Frank, do you want to go ahead? TJ, can you unmute Frank? He's there, I believe I'm trouble. connected now. Can everyone hear? Very good. Yep. Yep. Okay. Excellent. How's everyone this afternoon? <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Good. Uh, just a couple of quick questions. Uh, the first is the strategic plan that was mentioned early on the call. Is there a source for that strategic plan, or is it publicly available on HUD's it, website? It is. It is publicly available. Um, usually, if you just uh, Google HUD and strategic plan, um, you'll be able to find it. The latest version of that. Um, is the, uh, I think the link goes to the 2010, 2015, but we actually have a more recent one than that. Uh, the current strategic plan, if you look for it, uh, is HUD strategic plan for 2014 through 2018. And that will outline our various uh, strategic goals, uh, our strategic, strategic objectives that uh, fall under those goals, as well as um, some of the metrics uh, we're looking at. And that's publicly available. As is each month, each sorry year, we have a uh, agency report and agency plan that goes into our yearly progress towards these goals. And that's all publicly available. Um, and if anyone has additional questions or trouble finding that material, please reach out to me uh, offline. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, and that kind of leads me into my next question, which was. Uh, the formatting of data as it's collected or gathered to measure successfulness of project implementation. Um, I'm assuming that the strategic plan will kind of speak to that to some extent based on your comment? And if not, is there any advice that can be given on, you know, preferred structures or formats or what would be most useful to HUD uh, in terms of data that results from implementation to measure project success? So, Frank, are you referring to implementation of your NDRC plan? Correct. And I'm, I'm looking just for ways to incorporate, uh, you know, performance metrics into the overall phase two approach to ensure that, uh, of course, you know, we want to be sure that uh, from a public perception standpoint that it's very clear and data driven um, the message of, you know, successful implementation and the impacts to the community to demonstrate that it was the highest and best use of taxpayer dollars, et cetera, and also, you know, ensure that um, future elements of the project uh, may be funded and, and so forth. So just want to be sure that as we work on that and as we develop those types of ideas that they're going to be consistent and with and dovetail into, uh, you know, potential systems that HUD already has in place or at least be formatted in a way that would be easy for HUD to use upon project completion or even through implementation if we're awarded. So it's an excellent consideration. Um, I, I think given that this is a little, this is outside the, the bounds of the NOFA itself, um, I, I can encourage you to pick the 
indi the goals and indicators that work best for your region. And then we on the HUD end can manage how we record those um, collectively, you know, at, among the recipients. But I would say for now, focus on the locality first and not on fitting within uh, HUD's baskets necessarily. Excellent. Yeah, and, and we would absolutely prioritize in that fashion. It would just nice be nice to have some visibility or at least some general knowledge on some parameters just to be sure that we wouldn't be too far off base. And I would also imagine that if uh, if an award was provided, then there would still be time to make uh, you know gener general adjustments and so forth to be able to ensure that any systems that were in place would talk to one another efficiently. Um, I I I. Uh, I'm guessing that that will be part of the awarding process. We'll be we'll be clarifying those issues. Okay, wonderful. And then uh, my final question, which is still kind of related to that, is uh, traditionally with implementation of uh, HUD grants in terms of um, managing metrics and performance evaluation and so forth, outside of the generally required uh, contract and project management. Um, I guess general requirements that are out there per regulation. Uh, do you guys typically work with grantees or subgrantees or recipients and subrecipients um, and expect some level of data collection and reporting and so forth in terms of community impacts? Um, I know that you know contractually there will be minimum performance standards and so forth just associated with implementing grants, but above and beyond that, what is kind of typically expected? Um, at headquarters for HUD in that realm, and any response that you guys can provide would be greatly appreciated. Adrian, do you want sense. that? <laughs> Adrian, do you want that one, or shall I? Talk uh, about yeah, I'd say go for it. <laughs> oh, so it really varies between our grant programs. Um, some of our grant programs have been established for a long time, and as Adrian insinuated, have a long track record of, of collecting certain things in a certain way, and it's sometimes hard to update that. So the newer programs, and especially this NDRC being among the newest programs, will have uh, a hopefully a stronger uh, outlook or a will have a clearer view of, of collecting long-term impacts from the program than some of our previous programs have. So well, I guess what I'm saying is I, it's hard to, to tell you what the NDRC will have based on previous programs because the NDRC is not based on previous programs. It's, it's a whole new ball game for all of us participating in it. Okay, excellent, this, but I, I would is, still, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say this is Adrian. And it, it, it reflects a bit of a sea change in the way that HUD and, to a larger extent, this administration is approaching uh, project kind of uh, project management and evaluation, and it's using data to get to those outcomes rather than just counting widgets. I mean, uh, for years, the HUD was just counting how much money we spent, uh, yeah. how much money we threw at a problem. There were offices here that some of their metrics included how many meetings they held. So uh, many many of our, our programs have evolved and our data collection standards have evolved um, and they will continue to evolve. So I, I would be, as Patrick says, I would, I would be hesitant to offer advice based on past examples because um, we're always trying to do a better job. And each program has a different kind of uh, objective and therefore different things they want they'll they'll be looking for okay yeah that, that's all really helpful information I mean I'm just going to move forward with the assumption that the overall objective regardless of program and given the comments on you know the past and the future that at the end of the day it's most important for HUD to be able to have visibility on the impact of the dollars that are moved to the local level and have a clear chain between the impact of those dollars and the project and you know pretty much the whole ball of wax from the federal government to the local level and how that money impacted the community. 
uh, in, in a measurable data-driven way. Um, yeah. and, and have it be clear and concise and essentially, you know, packaged in a way that it's easy for that information to be used at the local level, at the state level, or at the federal level to be able to communicate that message in a way that's unquestionable. But not at for it better. <laughs> that is the challenge. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, uh, our, our goal is to try to incorporate that um, best we can, you know, of course, as you guys mentioned and are aware. Uh, every situation and every circumstance is going to require a different approach in order to make that a reality, and there are a lot of players, um, regardless of where you're at in the nation, to be able to make that a reality. But the uh, you know, best thing that we can do is just try to set up a framework that would result in that and, uh, and try to do the best we can to implement that if we're awarded. You're right. So, Frank, I, w I will say, this is Patrick again, I, w I will say, yeah, pick what works best for your locality. And that will be what works best for us because each project will be different. And like you said, all the players are different. And so what, what, however you tell the story strongest will also be how we will tell the story the strongest. So Excellent. I think with that, um, we are a few minutes over time here. I want to thank you all for joining us. Hopefully uh, this has been informative. If you have any questions, our emails are up here. Um, and hopefully we'll have the recording and the, the PowerPoint of this posted up on the HUD exchange shortly, I, I imagine within the week. Uh, but that's up to the Cloudburst guys. But thank you again all for joining us, and uh, we look forward to you joining us for the next webinar in the series. Excellent. Thanks, everyone, and uh, have a wonderful afternoon. You too.